So it was July 8th, 2016. It's a day that I'm confident that I will never forget. First of all, I won't forget it because that was my son's 21st birthday. But the other reason I won't forget it is because where I was sitting at that point that, I'm, that causes me to remember was probably one of the greatest faith challenges that I've ever faced in my life. It literally was a life or death situation. Because you see, as I peered between my legs, 13,500 feet down was the earth's surface. And the voice behind me just tells me to lean forward and roll over and begin probably the greatest adventure that you'll ever see and you'll ever experience. Probably of all the amusement parks I've ever gone to, this, this particular experience, as the screen will show you, was, was uncomparable to anything else in my life. But you know, there's a lot going on when I'm sitting on the, on the floor of this plane with this door open 13,500 feet above the Earth's surface. I mean, I'm feeling fear, I'm feeling anxiety, I'm feeling just the, the adrenaline, adrenaline rush. I'm probably feeling fear and anxiety because, because I'm about to fall out of a plane and I don't even have one of these on. And so in a sense, I'm, I'm falling to my own death, in a sense. I'm agreeing to to just fall out of this plane and fall 13,500 feet down without a parachute. You know, the, the confidence that I had in that moment of faith wasn't in the parachute. It wasn't in the orientation I had to go through. It wasn't in all the documents that I had to sign to, to say, I'm not going to hold you responsible that if this ends badly, that um, you're, you're going to get sued. Um, it wasn't even in the conversations that I had with, with anyone at the skydiving company. My confidence was in the guy that was strapped on my back. You know, I didn't have one of these on, but I was tightly adhered to the person right behind me. We call that the tandem instructor. That tandem instructor's name was Art. Here's a picture of me and Art experiencing this amazing ride, as I will call it, as we fall 13,500 feet. So the first 8,500 feet, you're free falling. No parachute, just me and Art, just enjoying ourselves out there. <laughs> just, um, that uh, that 8,500 feet happens in 50 seconds that you're falling, and then at 5,000 feet, you, you pull the cord, and the parachute or the canopy comes out, and then you get to kind of just to enjoy the rest of the ride down, as opposed to just falling to the earth at that point. I share that illustration with you because this morning, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about the concept of greater things, and more specifically, the concept of faith. It's something that toward the end of the year, the Lord, the Lord really challenged me through some other messages by some pastors that I was listening to. And as I thought about this topic and this opportunity, as we, as Shauna says, as we just recently turned the calendar from 2020 to 2021, I felt like that, that faith is really the topic that we need to talk about. Are we going to be a people of faith? in 2021. I want to look at a verse, in, and we're, we're going to be all over the place. So if you have your Bibles, just be ready to have a Bible drill. We're going to, we're going to begin in John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. John chapter 14, John is actually one of Jesus' 12 disciples that he chose when he was on the earth and was having a public ministry. And actually, we know that John is probably the closest disciple by some of the things that are said to him. He's also probably the youngest disciple. And so John is giving us an eyewitness account of Jesus' ministry and his teachings and his, and his, and his miracles that he, that he performed but in John chapter 14, really, if you're, if you're familiar with this account that J John writes, John chapter 14 through 16 is what we call the last discourse. 
It's Jesus' last time that he's going to spend with his disciples before he knows that he's going to step into this process of fulfilling the reason why he came, which was ultimately to come to die on the cross for our sins. He knows that process is imminent. And so in John 14 through 16, he's giving his last instructions. These are his last words to his followers. And he says this as part of his last words in verse 12 of chapter 14 of John. He says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So as I thought about 2021 and some of the conversations that we've been having on our pastoral team is, are we going to be people of faith in 2021? Are we going to be people that believe that God has greater things for the family church in in 2021? I mean, if I'm going to be real honest with you, 2020 was hard. It wasn't necessarily as hard for me as it was for a bunch of other people in terms of those who have contacted COVID and those people who have lost people to COVID, those sorts of things. But it was hard in the sense that as, as I evaluate my own self, I would say that 2021 was not a year of faith for me. I didn't really believe God for greater things. I'm not saying that I didn't walk by faith. I'm saying that I didn't believe God for greater things with faith. Because I was so stuck in the sense of what was going on in our society and the tragedy and all these other things. Did my view of God change since 2020? No, it didn't change. I still believe the very same things, the very... But I don't feel like that I was exercising that at a greater level. And I don't want that to be true in 2021. And I hope you don't want that to be true in 2021 of your life either, if that's true of you as well. And so really, I'm just going to lay it out this morning. My purpose this morning is to, is to make you uncomfortable, is to challenge you, is to persuade you to be different, to believe more, to know that there's greater things that Jesus talks about But those greater things, as he says here in in verse 12, are dependent on our faith or our belief in him. And so what I'd like to talk about this morning is I'd like to give you three points which I believe that must be true of our faith in order for the family church to experience greater things in the year 2021. And the first of those is the object of our faith must be Jesus. The object of our faith must be Jesus. You know, we all have faith, but what is our faith in? Tim Keller wrote a book a while back called The Reason for God, Belief in the Age of Skepticism. And he said this, he said, it is not the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith that actually saves you. You know, as as I begin looking into this this concept, this, this, this thought of faith, it's all over the Bible. I mean, in this Christmas Eve service, I, talk, I was up here and I talked about Abraham and the promise that he was given. And in verse uh, 6 of chapter 15 of Genesis, it says, it says that he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. The, words, the word faith and the word believe are like kissing cousins in the Bible. They speak of the same concept. They're interchangeable. Some of your versions, and even in John chapter 14, verse 12, may use the word faith, and some of your versions may use the word belief. If you look at what John is trying to accomplish, John, the the author of this, this book, he tells us in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he tells us this. He says, So then, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The the whole purpose of this, this, this 
eyewitness account that John is giving to us is to help us know who Jesus is and what he has done in order that we may respond to him in belief, that we may put our faith in him, that he may become the object of our faith because we know, those of us that are followers of him, that Jesus is the only one that can save. As Sean said earlier, there isn't another thing that the, the, that the world system or anyone else offers. They may offer some really good teaching to follow, but they don't fix our problem. And Jesus came to fix our problem because we were designed to have a life, and that life is eternal. In Genesis chapter 3, we made a very poor choice. I say we because I'm sure that if you or I were there, we probably would have done the very same thing with our own free will and ate the fruit. And at that point, we started free falling without the parachute. And we needed someone to attach ourselves. We needed to find our tandem partner that had the parachute that would save us. And that's God's desire. That's what he wants to do. 83 times in this eyewitness account that John gives us, he uses the word believe. You know, if you want to know, I wasn't very good at English, and I hated the English, the subject of English. I was more of a math and science person growing up. Um, but if you want to know what a, the emphasis, what the point of a person is talking about, you look at key words, and one of the key words in the gospel, according to the, the disciple John, is believe. And as I showed you, he even tells you at the end of this account what his intent was and why he wrote what he wrote. You know, there were more things that he could have reported. There were probably more teachings he could have told us about. There are more miracles. But what he put in here was to help you decide that Jesus really is who he said he was. And he is the worthy object of our faith. If I get completely honest, I think, the, I think one of the greatest sins in my own life and in the church today is unbelief. Is unbelief. As I said, 2021, I didn't change my view of God, but I didn't follow through on my belief of God. I was driving to lunch uh, a number of years ago when I worked at Perry Roofing as the residential salesperson there with a bunch of guys, and the guy in my passenger seat as I was driving was also a follower of Jesus, a, a Christian, and, and we passed this, this church marquee sign, and the church marquee sign said, when all else fails, turn to Jesus. When all else fails, turn to Jesus. That may, that may sound really cute, but there, that, that's not really, I think, the kind of faith that God's calling us to. That he's the last resort for, for whatever situation we're going through. I was recently asked by a college girl that was at our house at my wife's disciple, and she says, why do you think that people, that the more miracles, more uh, supernatural stuff happens overseas? And my answer was, because the first thing they go to is Jesus. They don't run to this solution or that solution or, or pull the money out of their pocket or whatever. They know that really all that they have, the only hope that they have is Jesus. And their faith and their belief goes to him. Let me share with you just a, a few thoughts here of how my unbelief and maybe your unbelief plays itself out in some different scenarios. When you've had a long day, maybe a long week in 2020, maybe a long year, do you believe that God is your rest as it talks about in Hebrews? Or do you turn to your phone, your computer, or your TV to, re to relax? When you lose your job and you can't make your mortgage payment or your rent payment, do you believe that he is the provider? Do you believe that Jesus said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you? When you're struggling with anxiety or depression, do you believe that Jesus is the prince of peace and offers you peace that surpasses all understanding at that very moment? Do you believe that he loves you with an everlasting love? Or do you turn to pornography, food, sex, social media, 
video games, drugs to comfort you in your vulnerable condition. You know, do I believe God is a God of rest? Yes. Do I believe he's a provider? Yes. Do I believe he's the Prince of Peace? Yes. Do I believe he loves me with an everlasting love? Yes. But at, that, at those moments, do I put that belief, that faith in action? Do I lean on that? Is that my response when a situation comes, comes to bear where I can't pay a bill or I, can't, or I can't fix my own situation or I have a medical need that the doctors can't, can't give me a solution for? Do I respond in that way or am I responding in unbelief? You know, we're in, we're in good company Whenever, whenever we talk about unbelief, because it's very well documented, and as a church, we like, to, we like to talk about it in terms of Jesus' harsh words. Jesus has very harsh words for the religious leaders of his day. And what they have taken this, this, this belief system and what they had converted it into of legalism many times, of following not just the law at this point, but also the traditions of the law, that they have put into place to protect even the law itself of violating the law. But you know, there's, there's, a, there's a little expression that Jesus uses four times. And he says, you of little faith. That's recorded in these eyewitness accounts about who Jesus is and what he did. Each one of those expressions are towards his own disciples. Oh, you of little faith. You know, for us, the comfort for me is that it's not about the amount of faith. As he talks about faith being the size of a mustard seed. It's what faith is, it can accomplish. As he says, you can say to that mountain, move, and it'll throw itself in the sea. It's not about the size of our faith. It's about the fact that we have faith in the object of our faith. And so if in 2021, if the family church is going to do greater things then the object of our faith has to be Jesus. And it has to be Jesus first. Secondly, if 2021 we're going to do greater things, then the attitude of our faith must be confident and expectant. You know, if, if our faith is in the God of the universe, who we know all these things about, and we can tell all these characteristics, these attributes of, then that should build a sense of confidence. If you go to Hebrews chapter 11, it begins, this, this chapter begins with a definition of the concept of faith. And then it'll begin what, what, what someone at one point uh, entitled, which a lot of other people have, have said, is it's, it begins to give you the Old Testament Hall of Fame of faith. Look at what, look at what Hebrews Chapter uh, 11, verses 1, 2, and even 6 say about faith. It says, now faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And without faith, and then, then in verse 6 it says, without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You know, faith is about confidence, about expectation. And it's going to, and, and the rest of this chapter is going to lay out these by faith Abel, by faith Enoch, by faith uh, Abraham, by faith Sarah, by faith Moses, his parents, by faith Moses. And it's just going to go through this, this long list. And it gets to the point, it's almost like the, the, um, the author here of Hebrews, who we don't really know who it is, but the author of Hebrews just gets to the point and says, oh, I can't keep doing this. <laughs> and he just says, oh, by faith, the, the prophets, and then he just starts, he says, and there's also these other guys, and blah, 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 you know. Because this is just going to go on and on and on. But it was by their faith that they believed. And the, and the faith for each of these individuals is noted, it's just a snapshot. It's like a, it's like a photo of their lives that you show of an instance, kind of like my photo of, of uh, skydiving. That photograph tells a story, and it's, but it's just a momentary story normally in a longer life. And many of these saints that, that the Old Testament tells us about who believe God, believe God on the, on the, the pre-side of the cross, 
not the post side of the cross. Their faith was in the, in the Christ, the Messiah, to come. Our faith is in the Christ and the Messiah who's already come. But it says that they had confidence, they had assurance, they, there was an expectation about what this God had said. When, when God said something to them, they put their faith in the God who said that. Now granted, as you read the Old Testament, you realize that they, they didn't get it all right. The Old Testament is full of these characters and even these characters that are listed in the Hebrews 11 made mistakes, just like you and I make mistakes. God's not calling us to be perfect. He's calling us to be faithful. So we need to be confident. We need to be expected. We need to expect God to move. It, it says in this chapter that, that, that some of them didn't even receive what, what God said, even in their lifetime, because they were looking for something better, something greater. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know if you're like this, and this is total a tangent, and this may not even apply, but it's kind of like having this thought about a meal that you're, <laughs> that you're like, oh, I can't wait to go there and have that, have that, that particular entree, and then you get there, and it's, it just doesn't live up to the expectations. But you realize there's something greater. There's something greater coming, and these Old Testament saints realize that there's something greater but yet at the end of the chapter, it does say, it says that, they, that their faith conquered, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, that they gained what is promised, that it shut mouths of lions, that it quenched the fire, the furies of flames, that it escaped the sword, you know, that it, it gave women back their dead and raised to life again. That it, but then there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, um, refusing to be released so that they could gain even a better resurrection Verse 39 says, all of these were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what they had been promised. Because what they had been promised is the Messiah. And they never got to see that. They never got to experience that. But they still kept their eyes fixed on that. That was what their confidence was in. But I don't want us to miss verse 6. That Hebrews 6 says, says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. I don't know about you, but that's really a convicting thing to me because, you know, I can do spiritual things without faith. I can actually pray without faith. I can do my job at the church without faith. I can work with students without faith. And you're like, wow, this dude is really a loser. <laughs> no, the, so I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help you to realize that we all do those kind of things, that we, we all struggle with the same things. But when I do them with faith, it, brings, it pleases him. The faith must believe, as it says in verse 6, it must believe that God exists. Again, the object of the faith must be in him. And that he rewards those who earnestly seeks him. In 2021, will you and I be people who please God with our faith? And let me, let, let me, let me couch this in the sense that it's not just faith for your own personal life. You know, God didn't save us individually for us to be, as I've said, spiritual orphans. He saved us to be involved in a greater plan. You know, you do realize that the church, as, as, as messed up and as problematic and, and as uh, challenging that it is at times, that the church is the bride of Christ. That it is his, his solution, his means to spreading the word of God, to living out Christianity and tr to a lost and dying generation. That this is his plan. And so as frustrated as I get with, with church, even this church at times, you know, I still believe that this is, this is the means which God's going to use to fulfill his kingdom. But it's not just about what we do inside this building. You know, if our faith, especially our corporate faith, is limited to this facility and the activities that normally that we announce on the stage in terms of groups and different things and, you know, men's breakfasts and women's Bible studies and those sorts of things. All those things are great because our faith needs to be built up. Our relationship with God needs to grow. I mean, that's why Jesus, after he talks about greater things, says, ask for me anything in my name and I will do it. 
because it is personal, but it is also corporate. And so in 2021, are we going to broaden the scope of our faith corporately? One of the ways I, one of the ways I want to challenge us to do that is in terms of our global emphasis. You know, there's a, there's a by faith couple that I feel, I feel like in, in terms of today's times that are living out faith in, in, in the midst of us. And that couple is Sydney and Nareth Meth. You can put a picture, of, you can put that picture up there. You know, if you've never heard their story about surviving the genocide in Cambodia in the mid-70s, you need to ask them about their story. And, and Nareth has shared that from, from, the, from the stage. I've had him come and share that with high school students because it's just an amazing story. If you, if you have the, um, the streaming service Netflix, Nareth told me before I came and shared it, he shared at the high school uh, meeting to watch First You Killed My Father by Angelique Jolie. He said that is the story of every Cambodian that lived in the mid-70s. And the fact that all these people were taken from their homes and moved to work camps and that two million Cambodians died. Nareth remembers the very day that his mother was killed. He's like, I think he's like five or six, seven years old at this point in his life. So this this man, this woman that's in Cambodia in the mid-70s gets out of Cambodia, finds their way to Southern California, ends up in an apartment complex where there's an American couple there that is living there to do ministry, to prepare themselves for overseas missions. And they meet them, and that couple leads Nareth and Sydney to faith, baptizes them in their tubs. That couple, near the Sydney, find their way to Newberry, Florida. How does that happen? I'm always just amazed how people find their way to different places. How do you go from Southern California to Newberry, Florida? But that's what happened, and then that couple ends up at our church. You know, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't really think that coincidences happen. And this couple, this couple worships, worships with us here. Well, God's put it on their heart to take the gospel to Cambodia. And so in 2019, they led a team with Tebow and Patrick, and the, the four of them went to, to Cambodia for, for kind of a vision trip in terms of just kind of seeing the lay of the land and to pray for people and those sorts of things and make connections. And they went back to Persat which is Nair's hometown, where his mother's bones still reside. And they went to Persaud, and they, they, they met with his aunt. In Persaud, Nareth and Sydney, for the first time, met their aunt's son, their first cousin, who just happens to have a theology, a master's of theology that he got in Korea and is doing church planting in Cambodia. Since the time that this team went till now, they've, they've baptized 30, they've seen 30 people come to Christ. You realize that Cambodia is in that window, what we call the unreached people group windows. 90% of Cambodia, of the over 16 million people in Cambodia, identify as Buddhists. Much of their country has never even heard the gospel. And in Persat, there is no, there is no church. This, this, uh, this uh, cousin is actually in a different city that's just north, like northwest of, of, of Persat. And so God's put it on Nareth's heart, Nareth and Sydney's heart, is to raise money. They're trying to raise $50,000 for a church that will also be used as a school because his aunt during the, during the week has a hundred kids at her house that on the side of her house runs a school for these kids. So for $50,000, 20000 to buy the land, probably thirty to, to build the building, they're believing God. They're living by faith. Is the family church going to join them in that faith? 
you know, are we going to, are we going to put our bullseye on Cambodia as a, as a church? Are we going to pray for Cambodia? Are we going to resource Cambodia? Are we going to resource, send resources? You know, flooding is a very common thing in Cambodia. Every year it floods. And so some of the pictures even there sent me was, was food that we as a church sponsor, that we, that we purchase for them during these, these hard times on an annual basis. Are we going to join them in their faith? So in 2021, if the family church is going to do great things, we must, the object of our faith must be on Jesus and the attitude of our faith must be confident and expectant. Lastly, in 2021, the evidence of our faith must be dynamic and visible. The evidence of our faith must be dynamic and visible. You know, in, in um, I studied civil engineering at North Carolina State, and there was this class called statics. And statics was something that, that, that didn't move. But then I had to take the next class, it was called dynamics. And dynamics was something that was in motion. Is our faith going to be something that's in motion? You know, in James chapter 2, and, I'm, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place. And I, my hope is, is that you're going to go back to these passages, and you're going to read these passages for yourself, and you're going to ask the Lord, okay, Lord, what do you want me to see here? What do you want, what do you want to do in me? What is, what is the lesson for me? What, is, what should I learn about faith in these passages? Because there's, you, we could do a whole series on this topic of faith. But I'm basically giving you an overview of some of the things that, that I feel like that we need to be true of, that needs to be true of our faith in 2021. And in James chapter 2, James, who is the brother, most people agree that James is the brother of Jesus, the natural brother of Jesus. He, he writes about a situation. I'm just going to read a few verses here out of uh, James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. It says, What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and is in need of daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warm, and be filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without, without the works, and I will show you my faith by the works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to acknowledge, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless? And he'll go on and cite Abraham, who's the father of the, uh, of the nation of, of Israel, and he'll cite Rahab, who's a harlot that's in the line of Jesus' genealogy as examples of faith that, 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 that was put into works. He's not, James isn't doing, he's doing a different argument than Paul's doing in Romans, which, which, which Paul's talking about that we are justified by our faith alone in the book of Romans. James is talking more about your faith being lived out. You know, let me give you three, three, um, Three faiths that I see in this passage. The first is demonic faith. Demonic faith believes, and yet, and yet they, you know, well, let me, let me back up. Jesus says this about faith. He says, he talks about trees, and he says there's good trees and bad trees, and a good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. In demonic faith, they believe but they don't even want to be a tree. But then there's, in this passage in James, I believe there's dead faith. They believe, but they don't want, they have no fruit. You look at their tree and it's like, where's the fruit? But then there's dynamic faith, and they believe and there's fruit. And as John 15 says, there's lots of fruit. Because God prunes those who believe and want to grow and they, they produce more fruit. Will we be a church of dynamic faith this year? One of the things, um, one of the things we're talking about as a church that you'll, you'll begin to hear more about is our whole group strategy and the philosophy of, of our small group system 
you know, moving in 2021, we've noticed that our groups have come, become very inward focused, where it's just about the people in the group. And yet we live in a community of maybe 200,000 people that are either unchurched or de-churched. De-churched meaning they've had experience with church and have walked away, away from it. And so in 2021, we're, we're going to begin challenging those groups that want to open the, the, the emphasis and change the emphasis, not so much just all-inclusively about themselves, but to begin to reach other people. We've talked about it, we, we, we talk about it as the front door of our church. You know, like, we have a front door out here, right? And that's, you know, we... For the longest time, and I think one of the things that, that, we've, that we've believed wrongly now in our, this day and age is that, is that we're the church, and this is where the church meets, and so they're going to come to us. They're not coming to us anymore. And there's a number of reasons, and, and some of them very valid, why they're not coming to us. And so our front doors are not really the front doors anymore. And so we're talking about changing to our group system where the front door is the group, meaning that you invite people to your group. And maybe, you, you know, it may be a group on Sunday morning that you're meeting in your home, you're inviting your neighbors or your coworkers or your friends to, and you're watching the service and then you're discussing it or some, some aspect of that. But, but, but we have a task force right now talking about that. And how do we, how do we move towards that in terms of ch- changing our emphasis to have dynamic faith? You know, we have, a, we have a pastor on our team named Jerry Burrow. And Jerry... Jerry has just done a tremendous job of kind of leading the charge in our community outreach as a church. And I text Jerry and asked him and says, you know, what is, what is the family church's reputation in our community? And his response was this. I'm going to read his text that he sent to me. But basically he said, a church who helps people and continues to love them. I've been coming to this church since 2001, and I can tell you right now, that has not been true of this church for a long time. For a long time. But it's become more true of this church in the last two to three years. As we have begun going into the community, much of that has been part of what we call our come and go ministry that, um, that I think we're calling something differently now, but I can't remember. But... Um, but our come and grow ministry of going out in the community and praying for people and meeting people's needs. This is what, his, this is what uh, Jerry's text said to me. It says, people call our church every week seeking prayer and, and physical assistance. We try to develop relationships with those who are unable to worship, even unable to worship with us. So Pastor Jerry gets calls um, from property managers, caseworkers, even psychiatrists who, have, who know that we are concerned about the whole person about ministering to people that are physically, mentally, and spiritually. People in the community know that they can call our church 24-7 and someone will help them with whatever they're struggling with. Most ask for prayer as as, as well as other assistance. Never has anyone turned down an offer for prayer, and most, most are weeping when we pray for them. They are desperate for authentic relationships. You know, a community, when, when we believe, do you believe that God, God is a God of love, right? Yes, we all believe that if you're a Christian. But does, the, but does this, our community know that God through us? Are they experiencing that because we're living out our faith that we believe that and we want them to see that? So in 2021, the object of our faith must be Jesus. The attitude of our faith has to be confident and expected. And the evidence of our faith must be dynamic and visible. I wanna, I wanna just close with this. Just some different faith goals I'm gonna throw out there. You know, our church back in 2000, I think it was 2006, 2007, we built this two-story building behind us. And that, that building cost millions of dollars. I don't know what the final price tag was, it was, but we've been carrying a debt of that church for a number of years. We owe $3.6 million to pay that loan off. Is this going to be the year that we pay the year, the, that, that, that balance off? Are we going to believe God 
are we going to sacrifice to get this, what I call this ball and chain around our church's ankle that, that is hindering us from ministering in this community in a greater way? Are we going to get rid of that? Are we going to step into the $50,000 that Nareth and Sydney are trying to raise for a school and a church in a city in Cambodia that has no church at this present time? Are we, going to, are we going to change the front door of our church? Are we going to be comfortable in our groups if you're in a group? Are you going to get in a group? You know, some of you, some of you, you need to step alongside someone that's a person of faith. If you feel like your faith is weak or you're struggling in faith, you need to, you need to find a tandem partner of faith. And you need to walk with that person. Because when you're with a person of faith, that challenges your faith. And that person, if that person is a person of faith, is going to put you in situations where you've got to trust God. You know, there's been a number of people in my life that have been people of faith. That if it wasn't for those people, I wouldn't have near amount of faith as I have today without them. Are we going to be those kind of people? Are we going to believe God? Are we going to sacrifice? Are we going to, are we going to stop using our homes as an excuse to not be involved in a small group, using our families. Are we going to, you know, one of the things, young people, one of the things, we need to stop protecting our kids and we need to bring them to the, to the house of God to be involved and see what God's doing this year so that they will see and have the evidence that this God is worthy to believe in. That's the kind of church I want to be in this year. And if it's not, I'll be submitting my resignation at the end of this year. Because I'm going to go find someplace else. If we don't want to be that kind of church, because there's, that's, not, that's just not what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with. I've got to be that person, and I want you to challenge me to be that person, but I need you to step up and be that person as well. Because this is, there's too much at stake for us not to be a church of faith this year. Will you be a person of faith individually and corporately in 2021? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you are the object of our faith, that you are worthy to be believed in, that you are, that you are who you said you are. You, you have proven that by taking on human flesh and coming and living as a man and, and teaching us heavenly things and performing miraculous miracles Lord, may our confidence and our expectation be in you this year. May, we, may our faith be dynamic, may it be visible, may it be felt by this community this year. May we see a harvest of people here in Cambodia, Lord, who would respond to the gospel because of their experience of Jesus through the, through the people of the family church so that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name.